not been in here in a long time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's been a long time since we've been in here. It's a different season, but I want to talk to you today, and the, the, the message of the sermon is a desperate prayer for growth from Psalm 119, 17 to 24. And as you're turning there, I want to uh, also bring to your attention uh, that starting next week, uh, we will be next Sunday, uh, we will be presenting to you a Bible reading plan we'd like us as a church to go through. It's five days a week, and it'll go through the New and Old Testament, the Bible, in one year. And we'll have more details this week, but we're going to be a week behind everybody else. So when it turns midnight and you're, you're up late uh, in your pajamas at home trying not to fall asleep, uh, you'll say, I need a Bible reading program. We're going to be a week behind as a church because we need some time to get it prepared. But I want you to know if you're wanting to go through the Bible this year, we're going to be reading through it together uh, during the week as a church, but five days a week. So you have a couple extra days uh, for other reading and, and, and other study if you desire. Uh, also, one more quick announcement. Uh, the office will be closed on Tuesday for the holiday. So if you're going to celebrate the new year here, uh, you've got a party with Judy and me tomorrow from 8 to 2. That's about how it works. So uh, you can have fun with that as it is. And we'll put you to work, and I mean that as it is. All right, so uh, the, the great question came up. Uh, I asked this on new, uh, Christmas Day at the end of the day uh, in, a, in, in a church group. I asked the question to folks, if you could have one opportunity, if your church came to you and said, you can change anything in the church, whether that be who the pastor is, what the color of the carpet is, how you do worship, you got one thing to ask your church to change, what would it be? Oh boy, your minds are already racing, aren't they? Here's the responses, and it has a point. I want a pipe organ instead of a piano. No one likes that idea. <laughs> Uh, the Lord's Supper every week, make Sunday night service every Sunday night, get rid of the drums, focus on evangelism, get rid of the stand up and greet someone for two minutes. That makes me always feel very, very awkward. We did that a few months ago, didn't we? Get rid of the children's ministry and get rid of family focus. Let me have coffee in the sanctuary and don't get mad at me when I do. Oh, come on, guys. Have some fun with this. Can we sing without accompaniment? These weren't people here. These were random people. Keep it short and sweet, Pastor. When I'm working in the nursery, your sermons go on way too long. <laughs> we need more deeper and more meaningful adult Sunday schools wherever we go. One person said, I would ask my church for new carpet. I want live plants instead of fake ones, but my church is pretty awesome even without those. How about we have unity in the right doctrine and the right practice, and this is for all of our nursery workers. One person said they would change in their church. We need a Keurig with all the coffee and hot chocolate to make it through the nursery hour. Amen. If you want to sign up for the nursery, we're doing that after church today, all right? So it's all there. Now, these are random people, but change is always something that comes this time of year. But one thing that does not change, one thing in a church that does not change, and, and a lot of these were sarcastic, and, and rightfully so, but one thing that does not change, if you want to grow a church, if you want to grow as a Christian, you must have two things about you every single day. You must have prayer, and you must have the Word of God. Without those, you have no growth. In fact, because the Christian life is a that cannot be lived apart from these two things. There's nothing more defeating or discouraging than trying to live the Christian life without these two things. And ironically, this was a pastor's group, mind you, and out of 60 plus comments, not one thing was made about the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? Not one thing, well, except one comment was made about prayer. But the Word of God and prayer, I mean, one is an ineffective without the other. You can have Bible study all day. You can have a church that studies the Bible and knows the Bible, but if it doesn't pray, we call that dead orthodoxy. You can have prayer without Bible study, and we call that mystical emotionalism, and that is where a lot of denominations, where they literally will jump off the pews and dance around like cats because the Spirit is supposedly on them. Yes, I just said that. Bible study and prayer together, though, lead to more Christian living. Bible study, God speaks to me, but in prayer, I speak to God. It's like a closed circuit. It leads to more personal, healthy things. Bible study and prayer are like a one-two punch. It's like a Mahomes to Kelsey touchdown, if you want to use that analogy. It is like that thing. 
Bible study and prayer have to be at the forefront of anything in a church, no matter what change is coming, because without it, nothing change, changing will be of any good. This is why Psalm 119, later down in the chapter, the, the famous verses you know, but the Bible says that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. The psalm we're going to study is so practical to this end because it's all about living the Christian life. It's focused on the Word of God and prayer. That's what it's all about. And in 176 verses, only two or three of them do not deal with one of these two topics. That's amazing. God's Word is so grace-giving in the life of a Christian that without these two things, we have nothing. You want to grow this year as a Christian? Do you want to see our church grow not praise God numerically if that happens, but spiritually all the more, we have to go back to the basics of the Word of God and prayer. If your Christian life is going to do that, you must have these things. As you grow strong in the Word and in prayer, these two means of grace will be a pillar for you. And no matter what you experience in your life in 2019 or what may happen in the next 36 hours or 38 hours of the coming uh, year closing, You'll never be thrown into a situation where you don't have enough grace and the power of God to work through. That is what this psalm is all about. And the big idea today is simply that, that a godly life isn't built in a day. It's not built in a week or at a rally or an event, but it's by the daily practice of the Word of God and prayer. The things that we're so often neglected. Look, God sustains all of us, and, and true servants of God desire to live by His Word, to learn by His Word, because there are wonderful things in the Word. And we pray that God will open our eyes to that this week as we study this psalm. But if you're here today and you say, God, I know you want to do something in my life, can I ask you just very simply, how is your study of God's Word? How is your prayer life? It's kind of like we all know that we all should lose those 15 pounds we gained with Christmas cookies we ate at Christmas time, right? Maybe you gained 20, 15. It doesn't really matter. But you know you need to exercise. You know you need to do that. And everyone's going to do it January 1st. Everyone's going to run a marathon by October of 2019. But no one's willing to take the first steps to get on the treadmill in January of 2019. If we want to grow, we have to put our energy where our energy should be. So this morning, and these are brief, but six prayers of this psalmist that he has to grow in the Word of God and prayer. He has a prayer of or for providence. He has a prayer of or for prosperity, for protection, for powerlessness. The, the, the psalmist even prays, God, break me with your word. Whoa. And, and he prays for purity and perseverance, all the while being persecuted by people who say, you don't need that stuff. Try this stuff. Have you heard about this over here? Have you considered what you could do if you stop studying the Word of God and praying? Get out of your holy huddle, psalmist, and get with the reality picture. Oh, how that is today. Oh, sign up for this seminar, and for 1995 times 12, your church will have the greatest growth explosion it ever knew. For $1,000, we can train every one of your members to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, the base of everything we do goes back to this. Either we are in the Word or we're not. Either we're praying or we're not. Either we're combining them or we're not. And we're either seeing the power of God through those or seeing the power of God outside of those. That is where it comes to be. With that in mind, if you're able this morning in honor of God's Word, and before we get started, I just want to say it's this Sunday, so we have our kiddos in here. Uh, so thank you for the extra noise. You can stand up. But uh, if you feel like you need to cry occasionally, you cry. If you, need to, if you need to get a, uh, an apple, get an apple, but uh, we're, we're glad you're here, and thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for your patience with kiddos and others that are here. It is, it is training for them, isn't it? Training to sit in here and training to be a part of uh, what we know as, as, as the worship time. So Psalm 119, 17 through 24, this is the third stanza. Uh, you may have at the top of your Bible the word gimel. Uh, that, that is the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. All the psalms, all the verses start with that in the Hebrew. But here it is, God's word this morning. The psalmist prays, Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. For I am a sojourner, verse 19, on the earth, and hide not your commandments from me. For my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, verse 21, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. 
Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your statutes will meditate, your servant will meditate on your statutes. And verse 24, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Friends, there's a lot of things we can change about Tower View Baptist Church to fit all sorts of preferences, all sorts of needs, all sorts of strategies. But one thing I pray that greatly changes among us and within us and through us is our desire to grow deeper, further, expanding in the Word of God and prayer. Because everything else that we talk about is great and good and has its place, but if we don't get this down, those chats are nothing more than just chats. But if we get this down in your families, in your individual lives, and as a church, it changes everything. Our power is in the Word of God and prayer and how the psalmist lays me in prayer as we start off our sermon today. Father, as we come before you, we know that, uh, Lord, it's been a busy week. It's been a fun week. Uh, it's been a sad week for many. This is always a time of year that uh, certainly brings about memories of folks who've passed or who are ill or who are far away and not close. Father, it's a tough time of year for many, but it's also a joyous time because we're with family and friends, even church family, which uh, spiritually is our closest connection we'll have this side of heaven. Father, we thank you so much for this time. As we close out this year, would you remind us uh, just how greatly we need these things in our lives, in our church, in our families, and wherever we go, the Word of God and prayer. Father, we don't come today bringing any new news for many in this room. They've heard this for decades, for, for, for years and sermons on end. But Father, thank you that your Word never grows dull, as, as, as was read by, uh, by Nelson, Pastor Nelson, that your Word is always a living and active Word and a lamp into our feet. Father, as we go about our business in the coming days until you call us home or you return, Lord, may these things be on our hearts and our minds. We love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, it is, uh, someone asked this morning, are you just going, what is your sermon? I said, Psalm 119. They said, you could just read it and we would have a sermon as long as you usually preach. Amen. So uh, we're going to go through it. We're not covering all of Psalm 119, but I want you to know this is the longest chapter in the Bible. This is the, the chapter that God has used in so many people's lives, but it is a psalmist crying out in the midst of a time and a culture that had nothing and wanted nothing to do with the Word of God. They put lip service to it. They put lip service to praying and studying, but there really wasn't a lot of feet to the action. So the first thing I want you to see, the first prayer that he has here is a prayer for providence. A prayer for providence. He tells us in verse 17, he prays, he says, God, may I keep your word and may I live out your word. Notice that what he says. He says, deal bountifully with me that I may live and keep your word. And he tells us to do this in two ways. There's two ways you can interpret this. Verse 17 could be seen as a prosperity gospel thing. It could be seen that, God, if I follow you, you will bring all of my greatest treasures God, if I follow you and I meet you halfway, would you give me all the blessings that come with that? Maybe you've prayed that prayer before. God, I don't know much about you, but if you just get me out of this situation, then, then life is going to be okay. But that's not what he's praying here. In fact, verse 17, he's telling God, God, help me to live the abundant life. Help me to live the life that is, is literally a life that is one that no matter what is around me, well, no matter what situation comes after me, help me to do it in a way that is pleasing and keeping your word. And you notice, you saw that in verse 22, didn't you? He said he's getting scorn and rebuke. He has enemies. There's slander coming his way in verse 23. What's happening? He's being persecuted because he's holding on to the word of God. And he's praying to God, God, whatever your providence, whatever your plan, whatever your, your purpose is for me right now, help me to be about the business of living according to your word. That doesn't sound like a lot of our prayers sometimes, does it? And I don't mean this in any bad way, but if you look at even our prayer list, most of our prayer list is consumed, and rightfully so. We need to pray for all things, First Timothy 2. But most of our prayer list personally are filled with what? Filled with health, knee replacements, heart issues, you name it. Very needful things. We need to pray for those things. But often, when we get in a situation that is hard, what are we praying for? God, put a hedge of protection around them. I'm not really sure what that is, but I always see God putting a bush around someone. That always is just a weird thing in my mind. What does that mean? 
But the psalmist doesn't pray that. He simply prays, God, no matter what comes my way, deal bountifully with me. Why? So that, so, so that I may, may, may live out your word and keep your word. God, no matter what comes my way, I am your servant. Did you see his humility there? He said, your servant, you're his servant. He's not suffering from the me, me, me disease. He's not having the Laban effect if you're in Sunday school. He's not all about him and his kingdom. Lord, if, if it advances your kingdom, if it allows people to know you, if it allows people to grow in you, then bring it my way. But Lord, in the midst of that, help me to be faithful to you. And so what we will do is keep your word. Lord, help the rest of my life, no matter what comes your way, to be about keeping your word. That's why each of us is a great reminder to us that each of us has been given gifts, a service, a life, a calling, but yet a brief window of time to be faithful to our God and to our generation. You know, I, my, my iPhone came out with this thing a few weeks ago, and you, if you have an iPhone, you got one of these, it tells you how much time you spend on the device. That's really scary. Every Sunday at about 10.30, right before the service, it reminds you, hey, you spent this many hours on the phone this week. Oh, thanks for the deflation about how vain I really am. But the reality is, so much of our time, it's not a matter that we, we can't live God's Word. It's a matter of, do we want to spend the time necessary to live God's Word? It's not a matter of being able to do it. It's a matter of, Lord, am I willing to do it? Do I want to do it? Do I have a priority to do it? But this is our prayer every day. If you're a Christian, this is your prayer every day. Lord, deal bountifully with me. No matter what comes my way, God, I've squandered much of my time. I've given things time that don't need time. But Lord, help me to live for you. Now, now some of you are going to take that and you're going to go home and you're going to say, man, I got to spend, as Martin Luther said, if I don't spend three hours in prayer, I haven't really prayed. Now, that may be what God has for you, praise God. But this is not a legalistic trip, but it's a check of your heart this, this, this Sunday before New Year's. Have, has, has your faith become so routine, so robotic, that you have forgotten that really you're here to glorify God and spread His kingdom, no matter what comes your way? You know, we will pray for health of people in this thing, but, but as our prayer guide says at the very top, we're praying that people would grow in Christ and spread Christ even through their darkest illness as they come. Friends, if this church building burned down and, and we lost everything, we would say, praise God, but we'd still struggle because we're human and it's, it's, there's so much that we have here. But I pray that no matter if, if something drastic that happens or, or, or if your favorite sports team loses their game today, that you know that your prayer is that you would live for God's Word no matter what comes my way. Lord, help me redeem the time. Number two, he prays also for prosperity. He prays not only for providence, God, bring whatever you will, help me to live your word, but he also prays for prosperity. Look at verse 18 again, as you'll see it here. He says, open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things of your law. Look, open my eyes. Lord, if I'm going to be committed to keeping your word, I need to know how to live this out. It's kind of like that first day of, of job orientation. If you remember this, you, you show up on a job for the first time, you're excited, there, it pays well, it's benefits but now you've got to actually do the work. That's hard. And, and the question becomes, will I ever be ready to do that? Am I really ready? But the psalmist says, Lord, open my eyes. Now, is he blind? Is he, is he sleeping? Is he doing one of those peekaboo things? No, he's not talking physically, of course. He's talking spiritually. Every one of us needs to pray this regularly. If you're a Christian, you need to pray that God would open your eyes of study every single day you open the Bible. Don't assume just because you've read it again that, that, that it's the same thing always. The Word of God never changes, but the way that God uses that in your life and teaches you about that verse may be quite different than how even a week ago God has done that for you. But this is a very dark time in this man's life. He's surrounded by enemies. They're, they're focused on bringing him down. They're focused on all those things. So what is he praying for? He's praying for the meaning of Scripture. He's first of all praying for the meaning of Scripture. He's not just praying, God, give me a word. You know, some people say that, God gave me a word. What does that mean? I, I don't know. God gave you a word. It's right here. You want to hear God speak? Read the Bible out loud, and God will speak right to you every single time, right? What is he praying for? 
He's praying that God would, as, as Jesus said in John 14 to 16, that the Spirit would lead them into deeper knowledge. He's praying for the meaning of Scripture. God, open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things of your law. He's praying that he may know the things that he ought to know. That's called doctrine, the teaching. He's, he's praying that he knows the right things, but he's also praying that he knows how to live those things. We ought to be God-taught and not man-taught, so to speak. And that is the second thing. He's praying that he, he's, he's not only the meaning of the Scripture, but that's practical in his life. Where, the, where, the, where the, the head knowledge meets the intersection of the heart. Where everything he knows comes out to be. That's what, as parents, we pray all the time, isn't it? God, I showed him how to do the laundry. Let's pray that actually works out and doesn't flood the whole house, right? And this is what it is. But he prays that, that, he prays that like Balaam before the Lord and the donkey in Numbers 22, that his eyes would be opened. And it doesn't mean the Bible is unclear. Let me be absolutely clear with you. This word is clear. There are hard parts. Even Peter said that about Paul. There are hard parts, but the Bible is clear. It's called the perspicuity of Scripture. But he's praying that the veil would be removed, not from the Bible, but from his eyes. And this means we need to study the Scripture in a way that honors God. It isn't a math or a science book, but this book has come down to us from heaven, inspired by God, breathed out by God, infallible, inerrant, and all those great words that we know. You know, you, you, uh, you are gracious to allow me to be your pastor by, by God's call here, and I can tell you, uh, studying God's Word as often as I do formally, not just for a job, but as a calling, that... I read the Bible a lot, and a lot, and a lot, and a lot. And there are times I'll come to a passage and just say, I got this, Lord. I'm going to start outlining it. And God just whaps me upside the head with one of those uh, things they used to whap people in the backsides in school with, you know. He just goes, boom, and does that. And you know this. You know this. You can read the Bible over and over and over and over. And the more you study, the more you need to be taught by God. And we aren't changing anything, but we're going deeper into our faith. We're going, as it might be said, uh, the, it's been well said that the Word of God, the Bible, is like a swimming pool. There's a shallow end for new believers where they can wade around and kind of get their feet wet a little bit, but the Bible's also got a deep end. And when you jump in that deep end, you can never get to the bottom of it. You don't want to get to the bottom of it, because if you get to the bottom of it, you may, you, well, you wouldn't have a God because God is infinite, and you're not. But we need both of those things in our lives. So let me just give you four quick things. I learned this from John Piper years ago, Dr. John Piper, who I think is well in his, he's chasing Don Harrison's age. He's getting, he's getting younger and younger by the years. Don, I don't know where you're at, but I love you. Uh, we were joking with him about that. But Dr. John Piper outlined this years ago, four things about what it means that, that God prospers you spiritually. As the psalmist says, open my eyes. He, he, he prays. Basically, that his will would be inclined to God's, I-O-U-S. God, incline my will. As it says in Psalm 119, incline my heart to your testimonies, not to selfish gain. Secondly, the psalmist is praying, open my eyes. God, whatever it is before me, I need to see. Let me see it. Thirdly, he's praying, unite my heart. Uh, Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And finally, the psalmist here is praying, satisfy my soul, Psalm 90, 14. Lord, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice in and be glad all our days. Christian, your life can go no deeper than how much you know God's Word. If you are in the same spot, if you say, I, I don't need to grow this year, I've already grown this year, I went to school for that, I did that as a child, then I can tell you this right now, you are stagnant in your faith. And God doesn't want you to be stagnant in your faith. Even if you're not moving forward in the way life would have it, are you going deeper and deeper and deeper into the Word of God? That's the question before us. Number three, he prays not only for providence and prosperity spiritually, this isn't uh, Osteen-like theology coming through, but he prays for protection thirdly. Look at verse 19, and we have to hurry through these, but look at verse 19. So he prays these things, and, and this sounds kind of weird, but he says, Lord, I'm a sojourner. I'm an alien on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. I mean, doesn't that sound kind of dumb? I mean, if he's getting persecuted, if he's under the gun for living out God's Word, why would he want to go deeper in the Word? You ever think about that? I mean, if he's really smart, if he's really about saving his skin, why didn't he just say, God, I've got enough 
stuff right now to live out? Just leave me alone? I'm going to go hide over here and do my thing. But he doesn't pray that. He prays for what you might also say is protection, illumination. He says, don't hide your commandments from me. And friends, let me just tell you today, unconfessed sin is like mud on a, on a windshield. You know, have you ever been around those big trucks before, and that big mud comes off on a rainy day and gets on your windshield, and then those wipers your, your, your spouse told you to get fixed don't work, and you're driving down the road and you can't see a thing, but you're still moving down the road? That's what unconfessed sin is. It's junk on your windshield, so to speak, and you know you're moving, but you don't know where you're going. And what the psalmist is praying is, is you can go forward, but you're not sure where you're going because if you're not willing to go before the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, hide not your commandments from me. Lord, show me where I have sinned. Show me where I have gone. Protect me from my sin. Protect me from these people. But, Lord, I want to know. I'm, law, I'm a stranger in a strange land. I'm a Missouri Tiger in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm a Jayhawk in Columbia. Tell me where to go. And I, it's a great reminder, as Amy will put this on the screen, but God doesn't lob commands at us from a distance. But He speaks His will to us. He's always near us, guys. He's always providing rescue and, 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 and enablement and, and, and how we follow Him. So what we know, and what we know is true, is sometimes you can feel like a stranger even among God's people. Have you ever felt that way? You can be a stranger even among people who profess to know Jesus. And as you get deeper in the Word of God, as you get deeper in prayer, you are going to feel like a black sheep in a white sheep kind of place. Do you understand? You will feel isolated with the popularity of a church that wants more of the world than less of the Bible. You'll feel, you'll feel and when you gather around your family, when they say things and they profess to know Christ, you'll say, I know that's not true, but I love them anyway. The more that you get deeper into the Word of God and prayer, the more you will have the experience of the psalmist. Lord, I am a stranger in a strange land, but Lord, I want to live out your Word. Lord, give me protection to live out your Word. And he prays not to compromise, but to have more and more truth. John 17, 17, Lord, thy Word is truth. That is what we know. He prays fourthly, and I'll I'll catch up here. He prays fourthly in verse 20, not only for providence and prosperity and protection, but he prays for powerlessness. But, but pastor, we're supposed to be all about the power of God. Here, look at what it says. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for all your rules at all times. Say, well, where do you get powerlessness out of that? Other versions, I think, get it even more correctly than the ESV I just read out of. Another version says, my soul is crushed. Maybe your Bible has that. My soul is crushed with longing for you. In verse 17, he said, extend my ears that I may keep your word. In verses 18 and 19, he said, if I keep it, I need to know how to understand it. And now he prays, Lord, Break me with your word so that my one consuming passion is to make you known and to grow in you. When is the last time you prayed that? When is the last time our church prayed that? Lord, not better programs, not better budget, not better this, better that, but Lord, break us with your word. Lord, bring the sledgehammer of your word on our hearts so that no matter what we're talking about in the church, we go back to your word and not back to our words up in this noggin that you gave us. Lord, break us. Do we have a longing for that, church? What comes before a longing is a crushing. Come on, guys. This happened when you dated your wife, right? Everything is going great. You're buying her dinner. Things are going well. You're walking on cloud nine. And then she realizes you belch every time that you drink a pop. And she gives you that look that you've known for years, you, you will have known for years, years later, but you get that feeling like you're not as close. And then she comes over to your house and she sees that your laundry isn't really the way that it is. My wife has this story too, because it's a long story about laundry and I'll get to that another day. But you know what it is. You had expectations here and they were going so well, but there had to be a crushing or you have a falling out. And you make up, and that relationship 
gets even stronger and stronger and stronger. Friends, I will encourage you today that that is how it often is with God, that you are coasting in your Christianity. You can say the right things on Sunday morning, go through the right motions, but sometime God brings a sledgehammer of His Word on your heart, and you are powerless to do anything except to say, Lord, your servant is listening. And I will challenge you today that the deeper you go into the Word of God this year, guys, the higher you will rise in worship and the, the more you'll want to pursue holiness. And if you've ever been crushed by the Word of God or been in a situation where you know there's nothing else that can help you, you can turn on the TV and they can talk. You can turn on the radio and it can blab. You can turn on your favorite music and it can sing. But nothing satisfies your soul more than having the Word of God before you. If you've never been in that situation before, Christian, you will be someday. Church, there are times that as a church, we need to be brought to our knees in that sort of thing. That you can have all the lights, all the glitz, all the glamour, all the outreach, all the programs, all the this, all the that, but sometimes, just like that old Heart of Worship song that we sang six, seven weeks ago, we need to get back to the heart of worship, that Jesus, it's all about you. And church, when we are focused on that, we can say with the psalmist, Psalm 1910, that your words are sweeter than honey. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my face, the honey to my mouth. That is the prayer of those who want to be deeper in the Word of God. Two more things. Number five, where he prays for a prayer for purity. You can see this in verses 21 to 23, a prayer for purity. Say, well, where do we get this? He, he says, Lord, I, I'm being persecuted. Open my eyes. I'm a stranger in a strange land. Lord, break me with your word. I want to know more. I want to long after it. But, Lord, with that, here's the reality of the situation. Verse 21, you, that's speaking of the Lord, you, Lord, rebuke the insolent, the accursed ones who wander from your commandments. So take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have your testimonies. And, and this is what he prays. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant, speaking of himself, will meditate on your statutes. It's a prayer for purity. When you live out the Word of God and you take prayer seriously and you pray these things as the psalmist prays, there has to be some cleansing. There has to be something. It's kind of, I've had friends, if you've done this before, uh, bless you and uh, bless your heart. Uh, you've done one of those cleansings before. Like, you put all this stuff in your body? I, I don't even know what it is. So you tell me you all know what I'm talking about. Like, not, I'm not talking fast food, and I'm not talking that stuff. You, you go and, like, you put it in a blender, and you spin it up, and it looks like, uh, well, it just looks, right? And you, you, you put it down your, your throat. Some of you have done colonoscopies, know this from the other side of that. But, but you know, they say, take this stuff. And your life is going to be so much better. And every drink that goes down, you are just thinking, oh, give me a hamburger. Oh, give me pizza. And you know the feeling. But at the end of the day, or supposedly, my friends will say, it cleans you out. And it probably does. It's probably a good thing. And then from there, you can launch out to healthy living in some ways. Guys, sometimes that's how God works too. Sometimes through His Word, through living His Word and, and being protected and, and, and prospered and, and growing in all these areas, we have to pray for purity even within our own ranks, especially ourselves. Why is revival not hit this generation like it's hit generations before? Me, you, us. We want God to move, but we don't want to do what it takes for God to move, throwing away those filthy TV shows, oh, it's not R-rated, oh, we skipped the parts, oh, but it just cursed God 20 times, and you were okay with that. What he's praying for is that God would do such a move that even those people who are against him would feel the power of his word. Verse 21, he tells him, he says, look, he's come deeper and deeper, and the persecutions come. He says, Lord, rebuke the arrogant. He's becoming a lightning rod of the storm as he lives out the Word of God. Lord, rebuke them. Is it okay to pray that? Sometimes, yes, it is. Because sometimes we all need to be rebuked. Even the Apostle Peter, by the same Paul, who he eventually wrote about later, had to be rebuked as he was uh, double-dipping Jewish and Gentile strategies in Galatians 2 for his pride. 
He says, take away the reproach. As God has opened his eyes, he's now being slandered and completely on the timeless truths of God's word. Lord, take care of them. But friends, I want to encourage you, as you grow deeper in the word of God, there will be joy that comes, but will also bring opposition from other people. How do you know a true Christian in America today? You're going to be weird. Truly. Some of you are weird anyway, amen? But I mean weird for the Lord. I don't mean wearing a, a, a t-shirt or, you know, getting your Jesus sticker on the back of your bumper thing. That's a whole whatever. I mean, you're going to live a different way. How you treat people will be differently. How you approach people will be differently. How you handle yourself will be different. What you believe will be different. You really believe that Jesus is the only way? Yeah, I do. Well, you're weird. Yes, amen. Because Jesus himself said that. But he says, all those who reject the word, they don't just reject the person living the life for Christ. They're ultimately doing, as Samuel told uh, the people of Israel, when they reject the king, they're rejecting God himself. When they reject the word, they're rejecting not you, they're rejecting God. And the more I've been led to stand on the word, the more I know, and you've experienced this too, the more you stand on God's word, the more you feel his presence, the more you know he's with you. And that's why he tells you what happens. Why are they attacking him? Look at verse 22. He tells you. He tells you the reason for the attacks. He says, because I have kept your testimonies. The prayer is for purity. God, purify these people. Let them know you. Father, purify me that I may know the truth of your word. But Lord, let it be known that I'm suffering because I'm standing on your word. Friends, there's always a price for following Jesus Christ. There always is. You stand with the author of Psalm 119 because the world has never been a friend to biblical truth. It never will be. They're never going to go hand in hand. And he says that princes, princes, I mean, we quiver. I'll be honest. I thought about this. I quiver and shake when a family member finds out that I'm a pastor. It's always one of those awkward conversations, you know. What do you do for a living? Well, <laughs> I talk a lot to people. You know, whatever. You're a pastor? Whoa. So... Let's talk about the weather instead. You know, it's that weird thing. I get weirded out. Or I post something on Facebook and someone posts something back that's negative and I know that person's not a Christian. I shouldn't be surprised a non-Christian's acting in a non-Christian way, but I still get offended. But this man doesn't have just that happening. He has princes. He has the powers that be, like the powers that be coming after him. And there's a conspiracy. And this conspiracy goes on and, and, and it goes on, but do you see what he prays? He prays for purity. 23 says, even though princes sit plotting against me, I will meditate on your word. Lord, even though they throw the muddiest sling of slander, I will keep your word. Lord, even though they're going to try and kill me, I will keep your word. Oh, guys, there's such faith that it takes to have that stance. The Word of God put him there, but it's only by the Word of God that he stays there, faithful to the task. May our church, may our families, may our lives be patterned after. Last one is this. He prays for perseverance. Look at verse 24, verse 24 specifically. He prays for perseverance. He says, your testimonies are my delight, and they are my counselors. Lord, this is what's happening Lord, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be. Oh, Lord, it's weird. I'm a stranger in a strange land. But, but this is where I want to go forward. Your testimonies are a delight to me. He pledges himself to God and to the Word. In the midst of the dark nights of his soul and his life, he has a sure delight in its inner joy. God's Word is like a torch. You ever been in one of those big caves before? You know, Mammoth Cave or down in the Ozarks, that one they always advertise on the billboards uh, in Springfield. I don't even know what it is, but you've seen it in, yeah, Fantastic Caverns. What a, yeah, that's it. we'll leave that one alone. But God's Word shines in His soul like a torch. He wants it to shine. And that's why our words and our lives and our ministries are insufficient in themselves, as you'll see on the screen. But God's Word is sufficient because God Himself is sufficient. He's enough. And he says, Lord, keep it coming. Lord, keep it going. Lord, let it not end. God, I can't do this without you. We can't go forward without you. Lord, the victory is not ours without you. Your testimonies are my delight. 
Lord, it is my comfort and affliction. I was crushed, but your word got me through. I would have perished in my affliction. Lord, when people are per- uh, peeling back the layers of my life, let me be, as, as, Bun- as Spurgeon said about Bunyan, that I bleed Bible bibline. Lord, when the trouble comes, may my delight be in your word. Lord, bring it on. And there is a delight for your soul found in the word of God. And it's not emotional goosebumps that you get when you watch a Hallmark Christmas movie like we've been doing every night the last week. You know, it's deeper than that. It's soul-sustaining, soul-anchoring. And I'm not talking about coming to a book and, and saying, Lord, open my eyes that I may see so I can get more gain. Lord, open my eyes so I may know more of you. But in the midst of it, Lord, preserve me. Keep me going. Did you see what he said there? Your verse probably at the very end, and I'll end with this. He says, Lord, they are my counselors. Did you note that there? They are my counselors. He says, look, Lord, if I'm going to live out the word of God and prayer, then I need one bit of truth. I need all the truth. Christian, you may not have gone deeper in your study because you have just committed yourself to one study of one God's word. I, you know, we all know people who... Uh, who rightfully study the Word of God, and when Jesus is coming back, and, you know, they, they've got it down to a science, you know, Daniel's week's here, Jesus is coming back here. Uh, they won't say the dates or anything, but they, they're pretty sure they've got the golden key to the details. And they're like those, those songs that you see on the Billboard Top 100 for, like, a day, and it gets, they were a one-hit wonder. They know this slice of Bible truth, but when God's Word is this big, they focus way over here. And guys, we should know. We should study the end times. We should know what the Lord says about such things. But what the psalmist is saying is, Lord, preserve me, but preserve me not just with one slice of truth. Preserve me with the counselors of your word from all bites of truth. Some of you this year may need to grow in what you believe and know about who should serve within the church, who is qualified, who's not qualified. Some of you may need to grow in what the Bible is, believing, holding to, defending that this is the Word of God. Some of you may need to grow deeper within your study and application of evangelism, how to share the faith, how to engage in the faith. Some of you may need to grow deeper in the basics of the faith. What is the Trinity? What is Jesus Christ? How do I know what is truth and error? I I don't know. It's so broad. But would you pray about that? Would you pray, Lord, don't let me just be a one-hit wonder Christian. Yes, this I know, Jesus died and loved me so, amen. But what does that mean for my life now? What does that mean from the prophets of the Old Testament? And this man prayed, Lord, this world is going crazy, but I know that your word across all the scripture is enough for me. Help it to be. Christian, I don't know what this year will bring for us. I pray it's awesome in whatever that is. It probably will mean more silly ties that I'll wear. It'll probably be more colors that you'll wear. We'll have a good time together. Amen. I love our church because we just get to have a fun time. Patsy, I don't know where you're at. Patsy said, uh, I get to wear a chief shirt. No one makes fun of me. Well, except when they lose, but that's a whole, no, I'm just, Patsy, I'm kidding. But guys, we are very blessed with our church, aren't we? We have a plethora of people from all walks of life and all situations of life. But one thing unites us together. We need the Word of God. We need prayer. And may we do it to the glory of God this year for His praise. Would you pray this year, Lord, as we close out before 2018 and onward, Lord, my life may be looked totally different this year as it was last, and so on and so forth. But Lord, help me hold tight to Your Word. Help me hold tight to prayer. And I pray these things as the psalmist does, and we will be okay because God is with us. Will you pray with me as we close out today? Father God, as we come before you, we thank you so much for the grace of your word. Father, we thank you we even have your word. We we, we know that so many, for so many centuries, longed just to hear a a, a sentence from your, your prophets and the silence that was from Malachi to Matthew before the birth of your son. What silence it was. But Lord, through you broke through that silence by the cry of your son, uh, fully God and fully man, and, and, and the life that he lived, perfect as it was, as the God-man dying for our sins, being buried, risen again, and coming again. Lord, we, we long to hear that, but you've given us your word from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Lord, help us to cherish it. Help us to grow in it. Lord, if we fall off our Bible reading program two days in, thank you that you still love us. But Father, let 
not that engine go. As Brother Nelson often prays, if it takes us two years to finish it, praise God, we're in your word. But Lord, fuel that fire within our church more than it already is. We're preaching today to people who love your word and who are praying so faithfully, more so even at times than than I care to admit even as pastor, because there's so many faithful people. But Father, even with those super faithful ones, grow deeper. Those new Christians grow wider and deeper. Father, for those somewhere in the middle, Lord, just let us all pursue you with the white, hot holiness that you've called us to live. But let us do so with graciousness and love and undergirded with unity. We pray for the, uh, the, the spirit of peace to guard the unity, as Ephesians 4 says. All for your glory, Father. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. But Father, let this year be a great reaping harvest in Grace Moore and Maple Park and our families, our co-workers, that people come to Christ. Thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. We love you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our church family. Be with those not with us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Would you join us in standing as we sing our last song today? If you'd like to come pray, the altar's open. If you'd like to talk or know more about the gospel, if you're visiting, thank you so much. We're so glad you're here. We love you guys. Let's sing our last song and we'll be out today.